You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, presented by Trainer Road, cycling's most effective training tool. Yeah, it's been a huge year for me, you know, winning E3 and such a great tour, getting married, honeymoon, book coming out and everything. But um, yeah, I think the highlight has to be winning a podcast Pedal de Cham award, for sure, that t-shirt. It's uh, quite a place in my wardrobe. This is only the beginning. You can't even imagine what we are going to do for the future. With exclusive interviews and the best analysis on two wheels, this is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Daniel Freib. Hello. Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. Hello, Daniel. Hi. Hi, Lionel. Confuse you there by looking at you, Lionel, and saying Daniel's name. You like that? That's fine. Uh, okay, so we're third podcast of 2016, and uh, let's kick off. There's been lots, lots happening, lots to talk about. So let's kick off with your weekly roundup, Lionel. Yeah, busy week, busy week. Just rattle through the news, shall we? Um, the UCI World Cyclocross Championships were held in the mud adjacent to the Zolder Motor Racing Circuit in Belgium. And the big story, of course, which we'll talk about a bit more in the episode, is that an under-23 Belgian woman, Femke van der Driescher, was caught with a suspected motor in her bike, or some kind of cheating device in her bike. We will shed a bit more light on that, uh, hopefully, or possibly. We'll talk our way around that in, in later on in the podcast. And that did rather overshadow Evie Richards' victory in the inaugural women's under-23 title race. Um, that's the first time that event's been held at the World Cyclocross Championships. Uh, in the men's under-23 race, there was another sort of controversial moment when Adam Tupolik of the Czech Republic celebrated victory a lap too early and then got out-sprinted by Belgian Eli Isabet in the uh, finishing sprint. So a bit of an unfortunate race for him. The following day, the women's race was won by Thalita de Jong of the Netherlands. And in the men's elite race, Belgian Wout van Aert won his first world title, beating Lars van der Haar in a thrilling final lap. Dutch and Belgian riders filled the first eight places um, and the race was slightly soured by van der Haar's allegations that he was doused with beer and urine thrown by presumably Belgian spectators uh, who were rooting for a Belgian win and got their way. Well, cyclocross sounds like a lovely sport. Oh, I normally it is. Normally it is. You know, and normally they don't throw urine and beer at people. But I mean, it was pretty obvious. Anthony McCrossan in the the UCI commentary uh, made repeated references to the boo. You could hear the boos mm. and the, the treatment the Dutch riders were getting throughout. And he made the, you know, there were significant gaps between races. Lots of time for drinking. So perhaps that that played its part. Well, yeah. I mean, I, funnily enough, I was going to say uh, Sven Nice brought down the curtain on a glorious career. Uh, he won the World Cup Series six times, two world titles. Little known fact, but I was appointed president of the British wing of the Sven Nice fan club a few years ago after a trip with the Belgian fan, uh, fan club of Sven Nice to the World Cup at Is that a very active branch of the Sven Nice fan club, um, Lionel? Not, not terribly active these days. I do have a membership card. You haven't been a very effective president then, have you? No, not really. No, I haven't recruited many people. And now um, it's too late. We're, we're venturing into Justin Rose territory. But the point <laughs> here, the point here is that I travelled with this group of um, increasingly drunken Belgian fans. A coach load of them travelled from Baal, which is Nice's hometown, um, out to Coxeda, which is up on the coast, and they were pretty well oiled by the time we even arrived at the circuit. And w I was talking to them about the atmosphere and, and the fact that you know they they do cheer in a very sort of uh, fervent way. And one of them said, you know, we, we cheer for Sven, but we don't boo other people. Mm. And it's very frowned upon in that group, certainly, to boo mm. any of Sven's rivals. So, you know, honour among the cyclocross fans, but perhaps not in evidence at the weekend. Meanwhile, on the road, the Challenge Mallorca, uh, Andre Greipel won two bunch sprints there, and the other stage is won by Gianluca Brambia and Fabian Cancellara. Uh, down under still racing going on. The Cadell Evans Great Ocean Race saw a solo win for the British champion Peter Kennett. Uh, Amanda Spratt won the women's race there. Um, I think all past Tour de France champions should have a race named after them. You know, with the Bradley Wiggins Classic. It would be a 10 mile time trial, wouldn't it? Exactly. In Hull. Yeah. What I about mean, the controversial Lance Armstrong? <laughs> That'd be a, a round of golf. N no holds barred. You're allowed to do what you like, take what you like for that. <laughs> Pete Kennett really didn't honour the great man, did he, by attacking to win? You know, he won, 
<laughs> hey, one of Cadell Evans' greatest victories was a, a spectacular attack to win the World Road Race Championship in 2010, wasn't it? Nine. Was it nine? From injuries, yeah. Indeed. I think you're right. Indeed. Yeah. In the south of France, Dries de Venins won the Grand Prix La Marseillaise, pipping Thibaut Pino, and we've just heard that the 2018 World Road Race Championships have been awarded to Innsbruck in Austria, the first time they'll be held in Austria since... Vilak in 1987 when wrong. Stephen wrote Lionel, one. Yeah? Wrong, Lionel. Oh, 2006, Salzburg. Salzburg. <gasps> oh. uh, uh, uh. We could cut that out, but we won't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, that is a very full and comprehensive roundup. It does make you think, doesn't it? We're in. We're just, just into February mm -hmm. and there's all this stuff going on. We've got to keep this pace up until November. And we're looking at the schedule, you know, for coming up um, and it's, you know, it's really kicking off. We're going to be announcing our new partnership with Eurosport. They were partners last year and we're delighted that they are joining us again this year. We'll, we'll tell you what's coming up on Eurosport and it's it's a lot. There's so much racing. It's very excycling. Oh, God. You want the red card. <laughs> so, did you watch Cyclocross, yes, uh, Lionel? I did. It was... It was the I, wonders of the internet. Yeah, it was a thrilling... It, some thrilling racing. And, and, you know, the atmosphere is phenomenal. It's like a cross between, I don't know, a ski race and a bullfight or something it's 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 very as you say fervent uh, fans there and and that is seemed yesterday to be tip or on sunday to be tipping over into something a little bit uglier and you wonder if you know we know what happened at the tour de france last year what was alleged to have happened well or it did happen we saw chris froome being spat at certainly we saw we heard of riders being being punched that it's a nasty little element creeping into the, the roadside support at some races. Mm. Well, we talked about this on the tour, didn't we? And we're debating whether or not to debate the wider issue. And the problem is that, you know, copycat type effect takes hold, doesn't it? And then, you know, what kind of, it's almost tolerated in one place, then takes off somewhere Although else. Although maybe we're guilty of not of being not being entirely honest about the past. I mean, Bernardino used to talk about the treatment he got in Belgium. He complained that he had beer thrown at him and think, telephone directories, which is I, a very odd <laughs> method of attack. we're in danger of twanging cycling's hysteria nerve, which is very well-worn um, with this issue as well, because I think you know, it, it's always been part of cyclocross. The, the tribalism of cyclocross is something which, in all seriousness, um, is distinguishes it from road cycling um, in an interesting way, an intriguing way. I mean, um, for better or for worse, in in road cycling, fans tend to just support all the riders. You know, you do get tribal elements, but the tribal element is something that's very present in cyclocross. And one of the reasons why I think um, it's it's gaining in popularity and is such a a good spectacle obviously you know there are unsavory it's elements that need sword, to be isn't it? I yeah mean, you they know, need it, to be what, controlled what gives but football it's magic exactly. it is the is the tribalism um, yep. and and the the electricity that's generated sometimes and the hostility poisonous. the hostility it's poisonous the more poisonous it is the more the greater the atmosphere you know and and in cyclocross as well you need that that sort of edge to it, but certainly when it, when it, as Lars van der Hart said, it, you know, he had, um, you know, beer thrown at him. And we hope it was beer, but you know, that sort of well, booing he's, is he's, one thing. He's fairly clear that yeah, urine okay. was thrown at him. So booing, so booing is one thing, but having urine thrown at you or being mm. punched something is something else entirely. Yeah, I think it's fairly clear where the line is mm -hmm. there, isn't it? Um, I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? Then my friends in the, the the Sven Nice fan club would say we support our man, and you know we don't we don't give too much grief. What to about your friends rivals. in the British branch of the of the Sven Nice fan club? How many of those are there? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, if we're going to have a very kind of uh, gentle, um, non-tribal mm. uh, version of cyclocross, I think we bring along the mm. British branch of the Sven Nice. Club, Absolutely. Well, why not? I mean, let, let's 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 claim uh, let's let's invent a new way of watching cyclocross. We'll get, pop along with strawberries and cream, a bit like Wimbledon, you know, mm. sort of bottle of Carver, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, talking of the line, uh, you did mention the alleged motorised doping. Did we mm. call it alleged? I mean, the UCI have come out and said it is a clear cut case of motorised doping. The first they've been looking for motors and bikes since two thousand and ten. Um, really, Fabian, when Fabian Cancellara won Pyro Bay that year, well, he won Tour of Flanders and Pyro Bay, and there were claims made that you know his victories were so um, 
so so dominant that that he must have had a motor in his bike. It was treated as a, as a joke at first. Then slowly, people began to take it seriously as as more and more experts came out and said, "Well, actually, the technology does exist. It is possible." And 2010 Tour de France, I think, was the first time the UCI were there checking bikes for motors. Um, Cancellara, I remember, was asked about the, the rumours. He said, the only motor is, in my, is my legs. But um, they, they've never found, you know, they've been looking ever since then for, for motors and bikes, never found anything. This is the first time it's happened. Quite a watershed. A big moment, yeah. But uh, as soon as I heard this had um, come to light, I just thought back to the number of times Greg LeMond has sort of tried to convince me that this, not that the technology exists, because I think we all accept the technology exists, but he, he's, he was adamant um, when I spoke to him at the start of last year that um, it had been used in races and that, you know, he was saying, look, I've got one of these bikes at home, I ride it, you know, it gives me however many watts in it. And that's, I think that's the, the thing about it. It doesn't necessarily, it doesn't need to give many watts mm. to be a huge advantage. 20, 40, 60 mm. watts, um, you know, used cleverly and carefully, um, completely could distort the outcome of a race. So, you know, the technology's there. They've been looking for it. In a way, it's kind of surprising it's taken this long to uncover something. And clearly, you know, we don't know the full story yet, but it's a, it's a bit of a strange one um, that, you know, why why... If you're going to use it, you know, you've got to do everything possible to conceal its use and presumably some kind of logistical mistake has happened. Yeah, I mean, in cyclocross, maybe the opportunities are, are there with the bike changes in the pits. Mm. And so maybe there's there's a greater possibility to do something and perhaps there was some kind of mess up. I did imagine, perhaps naively, that when or if and when somebody was caught, that there would be no hiding place. You couldn't come out with any kind of dog ate my homework type excuse. But lo and behold, um, that's what's happened. And in this case, uh, she claims that the bike belonged to a, the bike was hers. She sold it to a friend, and the friend had obviously installed it. And most of that bike suddenly uh, ends up back in her, you know, in the pits for her to, to use at the, the the world championships. It's with exactly the same position and everything else, it seems slightly far-fetched to me. Yeah, it sounded like a fairly carefully constructed alibi, right down to the fact that um, there were the the girl in question's um, initials were engraved, or that there was a sticker with her initials on on the bike. So um, that obviously made it slightly difficult to, to mm. claim that um, it, it didn't belong to her, hadn't belonged to her. So she came up with the well excuse or explanation that it had been her bike but she sold it and um you know there's a bit of background intrigue as well involving her father um he appeared on sports so yesterday in the belgian television network in that the, well they did i think the only interview with femco van den Driesen. and the father was there he answered questions and we subsequently learned that He's facing charges or allegations of stealing canaries from pet shops in Belgium. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a classic cycling story. Um, you you really couldn't make it up, could you? A brother is serving a doping ban. Um, quintessentially Belgian. Quintessentially, you know, cycling. cycling. Quintessentially cycling. The canary in the coal mine. Story. Not in this case. It was canary the canary the from the pet shop. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's happened. So, you know, and it's it's the kind of story that gets picked up by the mainstream media, mm. you know. Um, doesn't really matter the identity of the, the culprit. It could have been any race, could be any rider. As soon as this happened, she's a pro cyclist, you know, motorised doping, found, a motor found in the bike of a pro cyclist. That's that's a headline that will appear in BBC, New York Times, all around the world. And, of course, people jump to the conclusion that it's a widespread problem. And I think we've always wondered whether it is I, I think there's a big suspicion in Italy that it's a big problem in, in perhaps Grand Fondo yeah. type races yeah I mean the what is fortunate about this problem that has been uncovered is that it should be fairly easy to detect certainly at the highest level it should be fairly easy to implement controls at world top level even you know top um, well races involving pro continental teams continental team teams it will be more difficult in amateur racing um and you know and you might say well what's the incentive um of doing it in amateur races where not a lot is at stake you could make the same argument for an under 23 women's cyclocross race i mean 
very, very best case scenario, you make it to the very, very top of that particular domain, women cyclocross and you know, the, the prizes involved are a few hundred euros for super prestige races, World Cup races, 5,000 euros for the overall women of um, overall winner of the women's super prestige, which is their season long showcase. So, you know, not an awful lot to gain. But then going back to what we said earlier about the fervor surrounding cycling and cyclocross, particularly in Belgium, and then you add in elements like um, family members who are keen to see their children's names up in lights and you know people well, do results if she wanted fame she's got it hasn't she, she? Has, so yeah. that's that's certainly an accomplishment um and you know she's 19 years old there's clearly an entourage around her she's not done this on her own um it's the first case uh, i think the rules allow for a minimum of a six month ban quite big fines as well um big financial penalties you know, it could go up to a lifetime ban. I, I don't know if, if that's, you know, does it come under the WADA code or I'm not really sure about that or whether this is a, a, a thing that the UCI... There's are... a separate article in um, the UCI regulations which alludes not specifically to motorised doping but to gaining an unfair fraud. or gaining an unfair advantage. So this is it's a clear-cut case of cheating but, um, you know, uh, Femke van den Dries shouldn't be the only person to uh, to be punished as a result of this if the if if the case is proven should she well no if anyone anyone else has been in on it then you know they they should have no place in the sport either but i mean what are the wider implications for this you know other than a kind of a, a dent to cycling's credibility um you mentioned the sort of the, the mainstream coverage of it and it is the tone of some of the articles has been look at what these crazy cyclists will do to try and get an edge you know now and and i think there's an element of it just undermines the whole sport doesn't it but to be fair to the uci they have been looking for this you know they have been scanning bikes and for the, five or six and years had, now and there, you know there's been a bit of mockery about that and and fair play they have you know they, they brought in the testing in 2010 under the previous president pat mcquade and they have, it's certainly not something they've shied away from. They've found something now, and, and that has got, got to, you know, we've always thought how, you know, if they are testing, the risks are surely far too great. You know, the, the, the chances of being caught are, must be reasonable to high. So, mm. and uh, another couple of positive take homes, I would suggest. And um, one is that I think this is a good example, it could prove to be a good example of a peloton or a group of riders policing themselves because I think everything points in this case towards a tip off. The rider in question, Femke van den Driesen, um, rode very, very dominantly a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, the Koppenberg Cross, mm -hmm. um, it, in a manner really that s rang all sorts of alarm bells. You know, she went away from the field and put about 10 seconds into them on the Koppenberg or part of the Koppenberg, isn't it, that they ride um, in that cross race. And um, yeah, it, it looks as though eyebrows were raised there and someone maybe had a word with someone at the Federation or the UCI and the test came about for that reason. Another positive that we can take from this is that if, if people are thinking about putting motors in their bikes, etc., um, that is also partly because the window, the doping window of opportunity has closed slightly. Uh, you know, there, there was no reason to even contemplate something like this in the mid 1990s because you know the the advantages of EPO were although again 10, if you listen to Greg Lamond well yeah exactly um, but um it, you know if people are now looking for slightly well it's very very risky um slightly ridiculous means to gain an advantage um rather than the old chemical avenues then um, at least that reflects fairly well on the work the sport has done to clean itself up. Become a friend of the podcast for 2016. For £10, you'll have access to our friend specials, 11 in-depth episodes that will take you even further inside the sport. All our friend specials are now available on your mobile device. Our 2015 friend specials are also still available for £5. To sign up, visit www thecyclingpodcast.com So I mentioned that Eurosport have come back uh, to support the Cycling Podcast this year. Thank you very much. They partnered with us last year 
um, throughout the year, uh, especially at the Tour de France, where we did our daily Peddler de Charme Award, and that was sponsored by Eurosport. And we'll be doing other similar type initiatives with Eurosport this year, I think, at the Giro and at the Tour. Uh, so thank you very much to them. And their coverage is really kicking off about now, this week in particular, the Dubai Tour and the Valencia Tour, both live on Eurosport. And other things like Behind the Stripes, a documentary following the Trek team is will be playing, uh, and that's available on Eurosport, also on the Eurosport player. So lots of coverage on Eurosport, the home of cycling. And there's already been, you mentioned in your roundup, Lionel, that there's already been quite a lot of racing. Peter Kenick once again showed that when he's given the chance, he's pretty good at taking it. The question is how many more chances will he be given remember we spoke last year about the possibility of him leaving sky for bmc maybe another mm. team where he might get a few more chances but you can see him you know being given opportunities in races like the cadell evans race which let's face it in the grand scheme of things doesn't really matter a great deal but he wins it very very impressively but when it comes to the bigger races he's going to be required to perform a team role isn't he i would have thought so yeah i don't think the i mean the, the sky pecking order with the signing of Lander, has, has pushed him down a, another place, really. Um, it's a bit Kwiatkowski like... Kwiatkowski as well, I mean, because yeah, we always thought of Kenick for the, the Arden classics. Mm. And I, th I think the the Cadell Evans um, ocean race was... ocean Is that what we call it? Great ocean yeah. race. Great ocean race. Um, was a good example of what we've mentioned in the past about um, the development of young riders at Sky and... Um, afterwards, Kenyuk talked about how he has tended to make the same mistake again and again and again of attacking too early. And that is the kind of thing that you you would imagine a rider could have, have kind of ironed out if they have that problem um, over the course of a few seasons of, of being thrust into a position of responsibility, having to lead a team again and again and again. That's the kind of mistake that they would be expected to correct. In his case, he hasn't had that much experience the, of leading the team. Of attacking early. Remember the Commonwealth Games road <laughs> yeah. he took mm, off on the I first line <laughs> with Mark Cavendish yeah. in the team I was, car. I was about to say, I think he's um, had a fairly suspect director's sport team. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you could have seen them arguing. I don't know what was said. It would have been great to have been a fly on the wall there. But without spoiling uh, a comment Daniel made in our forthcoming Friends of the Podcast special about the history of the HTC High Road team, Daniel, you mentioned about Telecom back in the day when they were the big super team. You know, riders that were in that team would be promised that they'd, they'd float further towards the, the top of the list and then they'd just buy in expensive talent. And that's really Sky, you know, they're not the only ones. Etics quick step are the same. You know, that's the model. It's a bit like, I don't want to use a football analogy, oh. but, you know, it's very difficult to... Get yeah, off the bench. It, absolutely, not. Like, it lineup. happens. It happens mm. again and again with Sky, and it makes you wonder about the kind of conversations they have with riders and their agents prior to recruiting them. You know, you it, you can mention any number of riders there: Leopold Coney, um, Nicholas Roach. These are the guys who were just signed last year. Um, Kenyuk, you know, with regard to um, Kwiatkowski arriving this year, you know, presumably at some point all of those guys thought, you know, there's a chance here that I might get a leadership role in a, in a major race. And then the big signing arrives and I don't imagine that's terribly uh, motivating. Kenyuk, uh, Kenyuk uh, you know, is, is a feisty young, still call him young, he's not even that young anymore really. He's, he's heading towards you know, mid late twenties, but he has ambition oozing from every pore, doesn't he? And he's somebody who does appear to be desperate for his chance. Interestingly, he says that he said it was Luke Rowe who urged him not to attack when he wanted to attack and to exercise some caution. He's a rare example of a, a young rider who's developed really well at, at Team Sky and has as well, you know, graduated to a leadership stroke captain. Yeah, and, and I think the flatter classics um is an area where you, there, are, there are opportunities at Sky. Um, that there has been a bit of a void there. Whether that's because it doesn't quite float, so Dave Browse's boat um, or those races in the same way that the Grand Tours. They those seem to be the races that really excite him. The Grand Tours, but um, if they if they are given slightly less attention, those classics, it also means that you know there are, there are chances there for people to emerge and take on leadership roles. That's kind of happened with Stannard. No one would have predicted necessarily at the start of Stannard's career that he was going to be a a, a major force in those races. The same is happening with Rowe. So I think that's where um, there are there is room for for young riders there. Let's uh, the, turn our attention to Mallorca as well, where 
the challenge Mallorca is, is very much has the the vibe of a training race. It's a it's it's a stage race, but you don't have to ride every stage. It's sort of a pick and mix race for riders with good field in Mallorca. Um, as you say, Lionel, couple of stage wins for Andre Greipel. Um, but the the real highlight, I think, for a lot of people was Fabian Cancellara's solo victory on one of the toughest stages over a lot of climbs that will be very familiar to anybody who's ridden in, in Mallorca. Um, to, to, <laughs> to some of us who've ridden in Mallorca, those are like alpine climbs and see Cancellara taking off and winning on the roads like that was quite a surprise in a way. But, um, you know, it is it was January. Uh, anyway, it's his last season. Uh, and towards the end of last year, when I was in the Basque country, I spoke to Marco Irizar, who's been his uh, domestique for a few years uh, at Trek now. And Irizar was interesting talking about Cancellara and what he's like at training camps and, and in the winter and so on, and what he's like as a, as a team leader. So let's hear from Irizar now. What's Cancellara like? I mean, what's he been like? You've obviously trained with him, raced with him. He's been the most consistent classics rider for the last almost decade. Um, what makes him special? I mean, you see him working on training camp. Is it is it the amount he works, or is it is it just his his sheer talent? I think that both things. I mean, he's he's really strong rider. I mean, you can see since he was really young that uh, his level is uh, super. You know, he was I think two times uh, junior champion already. You know, world champion in the TT. But also he works a lot. You know, uh, he goes to Gran Canaria be beginning from December, and then he's really constant. You know. And of course, I think one of the things that he's able to handle the pressure, you know, because these riders, I mean, all the big riders, they have a big pressure. And, and sometimes this is the difference between the good riders and the super big champions, you know, the the way that they are able to handle and to keep the, the pressure. And, you know, like, uh, I think that this, this is not easy, you know, when you know that, uh, for example, now when he's out, I mean, the team, when Fabian is out, our team, you know, we have really big problems, you know. So I think that for, for him, it can be easy, you know, to, to know that 70 families almost depend on what you are doing on the road, you know? So Yeah, and because he has been such a, a huge figurehead for the team. Is he somebody who on training camps, you know, in the south of Spain in December, is he, is he ripping everyone's legs off there? Is he doing double sessions? What, is his condition always that much better than everybody else's? No, the, for this, in the, in the training camps, he's really quiet. He is never, he's not the kind of rider that he makes exhibitions training or, or, you know, he... No, for this, he's really quiet. He always tries to go quiet and he says, hey, we need to make the shows in the races, not in the training, you know? So for this, it's really easy. And, uh, for example, we train in two groups, the classic groups and the Grand Tunes group. And of course, I'm in the classic group, and it's, it's super good that Fabian is there because nobody attacks, and we go really smooth. And for this, is really, really good, you know, really good. But it's actually easier if he's in the group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, and then nobody, nobody attacks when he's there. He, uh, everybody knows that he doesn't like to to make stupid things. So everybody goes, I mean, pretty not serious, but you know, like we do what we need to do, and we don't start doing uh, stupid things, you know. And in in the races itself, when it comes to you know the day of Flanders, day of Roubaix. What's his? What's he like? Is he very calm? Is he very good at putting you all at ease and telling you what your jobs are? Yeah, of course. Uh, nor normally we do a meeting the day before, and then Dirk talks. That Dirk and Luca, I mean the manager and the director, they talk. They say what is going to be the tactic, and then he says what he thinks. You know, more or less we have the like a system. Let's say like the way of working. You know, like each one has his own role. Normally, I, w I used to start uh, the first one to pull were me and Jesse Sargent. So, and then we have like order, and this we never change. So, we don't need to talk about this, for example. But he he says what how he sees the race and how he feels and all the stuff. And then in the race, yeah, you can feel. I mean, when he's the on, for example, normally in Flanders and Rue, in the first case, he used to be pretty relaxed. You know, we are doing our job, and he used to be relaxed. But you you think that he's relaxed, but when I don't know when a group is is going straight away from he says from the radio, okay guys, you, we need to close this group, you know. So he's like, a, I mean, <coughs> you need to be like a big rider, but also like big champion, you know, big leader. Uh, he is a big leader. For so us. he's always paying attention. Of course, I mean, of course, because if he if he make a mistake, I mean, we are gonna pay really expensive, you know. Mm. So that's why. It's, I mean, he's really paying attention to everything, the tyres and with the bikes or the clothing and with everything. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Join us on Twitter and Facebook. 
Just search online for The Cycling Podcast. So we heard there from Mark is our domestique at Trek, Segafredo. Uh, and he's been a teammate Take of four that Fabio <laughs> Cancellara's for a, a few years. Um, but he was talking about having ridden with Cancellara and looking ahead to his final year. He will be determined to get, you know, to go out on a high. Cancellara, Spartacus, he's got a real strong sense, I think, of his own legacy and mythology, hasn't he? he he's not going to want to go out with a whimper. He, he wants to go out... Um, winning another Flanders or a Roubaix. Yeah, win another Cobble Classic. Uh, the Tour de France goes to his home city, Bern, uh, and the World Championships in Doha. You you know, you wouldn't rule him out from being one of the big contenders there. I mm. mean, if he were to win the world title, which, you know, could happen, would he retire, would he bow out, or would he carry on one more year? You'd have to, you know, although it is his last season, if he won the world title, surely he'd wear the rainbow jersey and do one more year. Yeah, you think a rider like him um, might be one of those riders who just carries on to the Spring Classics and bows out then, as I think mm. Tom Bonin might do eventually. I just realised, you know, that was incredible speculation for me there. Very unlike me to look a, look to the end of the season <sighs> Extraordinary. and predict, you know, like needle in a haystack stuff, isn't it? But it's a big year um, for the last, uh, you know, for the, the two giants of the Cobble Classics, isn't I mean, it? Cancellara had an absolute nightmare last year mm. and you don't want to read too much into a race in Majorca um, in January, but it was quite an impressive performance. It, it, it suggests that he's worked hard over the winter and he's in decent shape. Yeah, and he's spoken quite a lot over the last few months about wanting to enjoy what time he has left in professional cycling and um, not putting too much pressure on himself. I also think um, his team, Trek Segafredo, has had a... Well, in previous years, certainly last year, they've had a bit of a beleaguered air at times. Um, or, or certainly, a huge amount of their or a huge proportion of their resources have gone into Cancellara um, himself, in just in terms of um, wages, but also in terms of objectives and what they hope to achieve in the season. I think this year they're looking a slightly better balanced. They've taken on some new riders of Bonifacio's there, who's come from uh, Lamprey and um, Ryder Heijadal has gone there. And you know people have taken their eye off Cancellara a little bit because he was he was out for a lot of last season. Um, might be a bit less pressure. New riders have emerged in the classic, so the focus won't be as squarely on him and Boonen as it has been at times in the past. So it could all be set up quite nicely for um, a glorious swan song. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast, brought to you by Trainer Road. Cycling's most effective training tool. Pair your power meter with over 800 workouts and 80 training plans to make you a faster cyclist. Visit trainerroad.com forward slash TCP to try Trainer Road risk-free for 30 days. Yeah, you heard our longer Trainer Road jingle there. Trainer Road training continues. We've moved on to a different programme, Lionel. I don't know oh. about you, but I'm finding it pretty hard going. Yeah, it is. It's all sprint efforts now, oh. isn't it? And, and high intensity and... <sighs> Much, much longer as well. An hour and three quarters on the turbo trainer. That's you can see Daniel glazing over and shrugging. Yeah, yeah. my but, legs are very sore, mm. I have to say. But, you know, mm. we stick at it. Yeah. We've got another another call with Coach Chad coming up and we'll be producing a column to zero on Trainer Road, our Trainer Road training very soon, which mm. will be full of practical tips for all the cyclists out there, like Daniel. Daniel. Mm-hmm. So... Apart from our own training, the actual racing is continuing. And we didn't mention the Sun Tour earlier, but Chris Froome is making his uh, start to the season there. And uh, a few other big names, Daniel, that we'll see over the coming days and weeks. Yeah, we've got um, Daniel Martin in uh, Valenciana. So he's riding there. Fabio Aru making his season debut. Of course, a season in which Aru is going to be targeting Tour de France. Mm-hmm. He's going to be the captain there for Astana. Bit of news actually on Astana and their other team leader, Vincenzo Nibali. It's looking more and more likely that he won't be there in 2017. Nibali, Lamprey are very, very confident of signing Nibali next year. I'm sure there are probably other teams involved. There's been talk over the last few months about Nibali's manager, Alex Carrera, even trying to set up his own team, possibly with backing from the Gulf states um, or one of the Gulf states. I'm not sure um, how that's progressing or if it's even progressing at all. But going back to Lamprey, um, they 
they think they can get Nibali. They don't expect to be able to offer as much as Astana, but the the general feeling around Nibali is that he's desperate to work. He's very keen to leave Astana. Um, not particularly enamoured with the way decisions are made there. Tend to be made by committee. Alexander Vinokurov, of course, has a big um, influence on, on most decisions, but um, there are others involved as well. And um, the, the one sticking point with Lamprey, as well as the money, although uh, th- that might not be the problem that you would expect because Nibali, by all accounts, is not terribly motivated by earning a huge final pay packet he's more and he'll not be bad anyway I mean whatever he's no saying. and he's I think he's well, certainly what he's, he's told people in his entourage he's more concerned with um, being in an environment that he, he wants to race in um, the, the the main sticking point could be staff the staff that he wants to bring from Astana and uh, I think he would particularly like to bring his coach Paolo Slongo with him from Astana however Lampre have their own structures Michele Bartoli the former classics maestro of the 1990s is a coach there and um, they also have a, agreements with a, a medical center in Lecco that seems to be working pretty well at the moment so they don't really want to upset that too much and and they might have to find some kind of compromise with Nibali as far as Slongo is concerned. So Nib- Nibali's going to ride the Giro? N- yeah Nibali's riding the Giro mm. but he'll probably ride the Tour as well he right. said he wants to ride the Tour as well but Rio is mm. a big target for him Um the Olympic road race. He says he got the, the tour and help Fabio Aru, which is that's, tantalizing, that tantalizing is, that, prospect, isn't that's it? Excellent. That's that'd be, be good really fun. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah that'd be that'd be <laughs> really good fun if that happens. But he's got to be the favourite at the at the Giro, I think. Uh, Nibali certainly. When I asked Mikel Landa a few weeks ago at the Team Sky training camp, he's riding the, the Giro as well. You know, for him, he said Nibali is the big favourite and. Uh, um, he obviously knows knows him very well, having ridden at Astana with him. Anything else this week, chaps? Any other speculation, gossip, Daniel? N- another small bit of gossip. Sunday was the opening race in the French calendar this year, the GP La Marseillaise. Um, famed, infamous for its curse, the curse that is visited upon winners of that race. Um, an assortment of misfortunes have, have struck um, winners of that race in the past, Thibaut Pino narrowly avoid, avoided that by finishing second. Um, the GP La Marseille nowadays, or as of uh, a course change this year, finishes with quite a, a fiddly little descent. Pino, by all accounts, looks okay on there. Possibly because he's been working again on his descending this winter. I know that Oscar Saiz, who we've mentioned in the podcast before, one of professional cycling's only or rare descending gurus and um, he visited fdj at their training camp in Calpe this he's, winter yeah, he's a former mountain biker and he had previously made an approach to fdj and, and pino via you daniel wow and they they turned him down so that well they weren't able to work he with him then with because he was um, affiliated with or, Giant. Or yes. or was it Lotto Yumbo? He his affiliation in the past has been with Giant right. and who was sponsoring well, Lotto were, Yumbo at the yeah, time and right. then Belkin, yeah. I think, yeah. or whoever it was at, at the time. Blanco, maybe. Yeah. But he certainly spent at least one day with FDJ on their camp, did all sorts of drills and um gave them uh, various types of advice about he, descending. He's and fascinating. Speaking to him about the art of descending is, is really interesting. The difference between descending in a, on a mountain bike and a road bike is is really interesting because mountain bikers, downhill mountain bikers especially, study the course in advance. They they know um, how to ride it. They they really think about how to ride it, whereas road riders you know, are just plunged down descents that they might not even know. There has been a bit of speculation about Pino's future because I think he's out of contract end of this year. Is that just a bit of gamesmanship? Well, I, I think, you know, he has said publicly that he's keeping his options open, but of course he's going to say that. I mean, um, that's that's sort Aren't of... Aren't we all? Ne- well, it's negotiation, it's contract negotiation, chapter one, isn't it? Because you, FDJ you, are, are confirmed they're in to the end of 2018 now. Yeah, and uh, his one concern, I think, is the support that he's going to get in major tours in particular that's been a problem in the past but they with every year over the past couple of seasons they've added new riders Steve Morabito um, came on board two years or the start of last year this year they've got another Swiss rider uh, French speaking Swiss rider Rettenbach um, who's come from EAM Cycling so 
they're, they're slowly putting the pieces together of what should be a fairly decent support team for, for Pino. So I, I expect him to stay. Hard I mean, to imagine him anywhere else, isn't it, really? We should wrap it up for this week, fellas. Uh, but please do become a friend of the Cycling Podcast if you haven't already. Thank you very much to everybody who has signed up for 2016. Your support um, obviously enables you to listen to 11 exclusive podcasts, but also helps to keep the weekly podcast free. And our first one was released a couple of weeks ago. It was the behind the scenes with Chris Froome in the lab the day that he went and had his physiological testing done. Our, our second one is being worked on as we speak and will be released imminently. And it is the story of HTC High Road, including uh, an interview with Bob Stapleton, who ran and owned the team. And, you know, very, very fascinating, revealing interview done by Daniel with Bob Stapleton. Um, and uh, I think we hear from Brian Holm as well so it's, it should be an interesting episode and it'll be out soon and that's available to friends of the podcast go to thecyclingpodcast.com and it's £10 for 2016 £5 for 2015 so you can still sign up for last year and get all of last year's 11 specials on your mobile device now as well so that's all for this week I think thank you very much Lionel thank you Richard thank you Daniel thank you So we heard there from Markel Irizar, uh, the Basque sort of domestique at Trek Segafredo. Is that how you pronounce it? Segafredo. Segafredo. So we heard there from Markel Irizar, domestique at Trek Segre. Seg- <laughs> 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 this is, uh, uh, Segre. Yeah, yeah, Seg- yeah, no, no, Sega. Segafredo. Segafredo. So we heard there from Markel Irizar, domestique at Trek Segre. Seg- <laughs> 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 oh, no. So we heard there from Mark Irizar domestique at Trek Segafredo, uh, and he's been a teammate. Take of four that was. <laughs> You've been listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Thank you to Glass Pair for the music in this episode. For more information and to download more editions of the show, visit thecyclingpodcast.com.